All right, this video is going to be um, based on a confluence of, uh, of events that have taken place. Uh, the other day, I was uh, going through the DVR, and lo and behold, I had several episodes of the Jesse Ventura Show Conspiracy Theory on there. Now, I have never really made a point to watch this show. When it first came out, I thought it might be interesting, and I set it up to record. And, uh, you know, the episodes have been real hit or miss. And so I haven't, you know, I, I just never really watched it. And I was going through and they were all there. And uh, there was one titled The Great Water Conspiracy. And since I live in Michigan, which is where the Great Lakes are, uh, and <laughs> uh, there happens to be a somewhat controversial water bottling plant uh, maybe about four or five miles from my house that I'm very familiar with. I thought, well, maybe maybe I'll find this one a little bit more interesting than normal. And as it turned out, uh, basically the center focus of the episode was about that bottling plant and the water supply in Michigan. And uh, I thought, well, maybe I should make a video about this. I even thought about driving out to the locations they went to and filming myself there, but uh, what the hell, I never did. But then uh, tonight, I was... Uh, uh, someone I've been subscribed to for a long time, but who hasn't uploaded any videos in a long time. And I'll give his name. I'll give his YouTube name, although I know his real name. Uh, the YouTube user's name is Romans Book Report. That's one word, Romans Book Report. Let me just give a little shout out to him. He subscribed to me and uh, commented on my video. Uh, Roman's book report, I won't say his real name, even though I think it's probably easy to find out. Uh, he is an interesting guy. Uh, he's an anarcho-capitalist. He's, a, uh, I don't want to say a follower, but he's heavily influenced by Hans Hermann Hopp. And uh, he was in the U.S. military uh, for a long time. And he has a very interesting perspective. And I wish he would make more videos. I think he's been busy with his life, which is good. But he just, uh, his that channel is a series of book reviews and he did a book review on a book about the privatization of water and I thought that was interesting within a day seeing both of those I decided I would make uh, some something of a critique of the Ventura episode conspiracy theory and uh, for some really basic libertarian uh, principles uh, as they apply to water rights now uh, in the video uh, Jesse Ventura you know, mentions this water bottling plant, which is located on Eight Mile Road in Stanwood, Michigan, which, like I said, is about five miles from where I live. Uh, it was built about 10 years ago. It's the largest building and the largest employer uh, in the county, other than like the public schools and the university. Those are much larger employers. Um, and they suck water out of a, of a spring that's located maybe five or six miles from the plant, the plant is located right by the freeway, and so the, the water is pumped to this plant. In the plant, they do whatever refining, filtering that they need to do, which is not very much around here, which is why they chose to put the plant there. And then it gets shipped off in trucks. Um, and one thing to say about uh, the water here, the water table is very high in this area. The soil is very sandy. Uh, you know, when people talk about fluoride and city water and infrastructure that stuff doesn't apply uh, where i live uh, where i live everybody has their own well every house has a well drilled uh, and then has their own usually they have a, a septic tank and then a drainage field and uh, that's all you need there's no central uh, i mean in the city there is but if you live out in the country which most people do everyone has their own well the wells tend to be about 100 feet deep, which is not how deep they have to be to get water. You can go out with a shovel and just start digging and get below the water table. Uh, Michigan has a large amount of fresh water, and not just talking about the Great Lakes. Obviously, the Great Lakes contain about 20% of the world's liquid fresh water, so that's not counting ice, certainly not counting the oceans. Uh, but if you look between the five Great Lakes, four of which border uh, the state of Michigan, uh, that's 20%. And then Lake Baikal in um, Russia actually has another 20%. Uh, <laughs> uh, between the United States and Canada, we're looking at about 50% of the world's uh, fresh water. So 
um, in Michigan, um, the stat I always hear, you're never more than two or three miles from a naturally occurring body of water, whether it be a stream, a lake, or pond. In my travels around the rest of the country, um, one thing you'll notice is there aren't any great rivers in Michigan because it's a peninsula and none of the rivers um, can be long enough to have huge water watersheds, so they never get that big. There are no rivers here that are anywhere close to the size of the Ohio, at least the Ohio in its main area. I mean, if you get to the headwaters of the Ohio, sure, nothing like the Mississippi or the Missouri or the Colorado, but uh, there are many, many more numerous rivers, and this is especially true if you go out west of the Mississippi where you can drive all day and maybe only go over two or three bridges that go over water. Here you would be passing streams like ponds, swamps, <laughs> multiple times in any given mile in most places. Uh, so the amount of water available here is incredible. The amount that um, the bottle plant takes out, it is a large amount, but it's about the same as a farmer would use to uh, uh, irrigate, which here they don't do drip irrigation, they just have sprinklers, the, the big kind that lose half the water uh, through uh, just spray basically. Uh, it uses about the same. Uh, but so Jesse Ventura said, well, well let's see the evidence of, of the destruction this is having on the Great Lakes. He went to um, Mission Point, which is up in the northern tip of Michigan. Michigan is shaped like a mitten. And this is about where I live. This is about where this water bottling plant is. And Jesse Ventura decided to go up here to see the evidence. Uh, up here, Grand Traverse Bay is on Lake Michigan, uh, which I think is probably the sixth or seventh largest lake in the world by surface area. It is like an ocean. For those of you who have not seen the Great Lakes, you can't see across them. You just come to them and there's water as far as you can see. Um, and Grand Traverse Bay is about 100 miles north of this bottling plant. He goes out and the water level on Lake Michigan is low. It's several feet low. And he said, look, this is what's happening because of the bottling plant. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I said in the show, the Great Lakes have uh, like 40 quadrillion gallons of water. The bottling plant is taking out um, approximately like 50,000 gallons a day or something like that. 90, 90 million a year, 90 million gallons a year, uh, which is nothing. Uh, the water levels on the lakes have historically fluctuated a great deal. We know that they've been much lower than they are now and much, much higher than they are now. By the way, I should say the Great Lakes were formed at the end of the last ice age, the Laurentine Glacier, when it receded, basically left these very large depressions uh, in the soil. Uh, Michigan is a very, uh, there's a lot of topsoil. There's almost no bedrock at all. Uh, in fact, it's more than a thousand feet of topsoil, so the, the ground is very soft. The tremendous weight of the glaciers uh, created uh, exaggerated depressions that were there anyway. I mean, it was a basin before the glaciation even happened, but the, the enormous weight of the glaciers actually uh, uh, exaggerated that. Uh, and as they were seeded, um, some of this glacial melt water um, remained, and there's fairly high uh, precipitation in this area. Uh, the climate in at least the southern half of the Michigan basin is humid, continental. Uh, the northern part is more of a continental climate, which is a little bit drier, but certainly not arid or semi-arid. And uh, left these gigantic lakes. So they have, uh, they have changed uh, water level, but there are far larger things that would alter them, like when Chicago um, created a, the, uh, integrated their sewage system from the, connected the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River, um, they basically reverse the flow, and so there's an entire extra river flowing out of Lake Michigan. Um, hydro hydrologically, hydrologically, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are the same lake. If we look at a map of Michigan again, uh, this is Michigan on this side, on the west side, across the bay, across the lake would be Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, up here is the Straits of Mackinac, which are spelled with a C at the end. They're spelled Mackinac. And there's actually a free market think tank called the Mackinac Center. And um, 
the correct pronunciation of Mackinac is one of the determining factors of whether someone's from Michigan or not. People from Michigan know that it's pronounced Mackinac as if it was spelled with a W at the end. People who are not from Michigan typically aren't going to know this. It's a French spelling of a Native American or an Indian um, place name. Uh, but there's actually a free market think tank called the Mackinac Center, which I've seen uh, the YouTube users uh, call the Mackinac Center. Anyway, there's the Straits of Mackinac, and then the eastern side of the Michigan Peninsula is Lake Huron. Lake, Hur Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are connected by a strait that's five miles wide and, uh, you know, two or three hundred feet deep. So it's actually, hydrologically, it's one gigantic lake. Uh, this is usually considered two because they are almost completely separated by the lower peninsula of Michigan. But uh, that outflow going um, out of Chicago is probably a much bigger factor in the overall lake level than anything that's happening at this bottling plant. Um, and of course, that's been that's nothing new either. That that happened in the, eight, in the late 19th century, that uh, the the flow of the river was reversed. Um, so the idea that this bottling plant is uh, depleting the lakes is silly. I mean, yes, any drop that they're shipping out in a truck is a drop that's not going to make it, but it's absolutely minuscule. Uh, another interesting point is they went to the um, the the area that um, it, where the spring is located that feeds the the, the bottling plant, and uh, <laughs> the 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 area is fenced off, and, and it has a big sign on it that says "sanctuary." And you can watch the episode of um, Conspiracy Theory on YouTube. The whole thing is there, and um, first of all, you can tell it's been um, doctored up. For dramatic purposes, because he says, "Well, I'm going to have my guy take me there." So they show him tromping through the woods, but the main highway um, runs exactly next to this fenced-in area. This fenced-in area is one mile square on every side, and the uh, western edge of this square touches the main highway, and so you don't need to go tromping through the woods to see it. And <laughs> Uh, Ventura goes and he actually says, well, they're obviously trying to hide something. It says it's a sanctuary, so-called, but it has two 10-foot fences on it. So obviously, what are they trying to hide? Well, the sanctuary has been there for at least 30 years, much, much longer than, much long, long before there was a bottling plant. And the fences have also been there that entire time. And there's a good reason because it's, they call it a sanctuary because they, breed white-tailed deer there and they operate it as a place for people to come and basically participate in canned hunts. You, or I would call them canned hunts. They would probably not like that term. This is a, a big uh, deer hunting, bow hunting, gun hunting area. Uh, it's a big part of the industry of Michigan and this was a place where you can go still and if you pay them a lot of money, it's in the thousands of dollars, they will let you shoot a buck. Um, to me that always seemed kind of asinine. Uh, I don't know what the great honor in shooting a, an animal in that way would be, uh, but that is the main purpose of this sanctuary, and that is why there are two 10-foot fences. It's not to hide the evil theft of water, it's to keep the deer from jumping out. Deer are phenomenal leapers. Um, I think Wikipedia will say they can jump 8 feet. I know people who swear to God they can jump 10-foot and 12-foot fences. I, I don't know if they can really jump that high, but you have two of them. Um, a, because it's harder for them to leave then because they can't get a running start. But the main reason is to keep them from interacting with deer on the outside so that if perhaps there is some kind of disease uh, among the outside population of deer, this will keep a 30-foot buffer between them and the deer on the inside and hopefully protect their investment. Um, so the idea that these fences indicate the nefarious nature of you know, the the water uh, production facilities is just asinine, and this is also obvious why the fences are there. Everyone in this area knows exactly why they were there. They knew why those fences were there before there was ever a bottling plant. Um, if you drive around the lakes, and there are numerous, numerous lakes, like I said, Michigan has a lot of lakes in that area. Um, there's an area called Canadian Lakes. There's, I don't even know... I think my my county is not particularly lakey, and it has well over two, three hundred lakes in it. <laughs> so, 
uh, and and those lakes they don't appear to be low to me I've been seeing them my entire life almost more than 25 years they're not low they, they have like homes and stuff on them so there are actually good benchmarks like docks and and boat ramps and stuff and they are the lakes in, me, in the immediate area of the water extraction are not any lower if Lake Michigan is lower that's very more much more likely to be due to changes in the general climate around the entire lake over the entire region over a huge region really and then this one little plant uh, and I think it's disingenuous for them to have uh, failed to mention the, the fact that the sanctuary here would have a deer fence around it they didn't even mention that it was a deer reserve uh, you know that's kind of a funny name to call something a sanctuary when the deer are essentially being raised there for the um, sole purpose of being killed later but uh, that's what they call it um, the people that he had a guide you know it's funny he calls a guide but it's right off a highway but the guide was some eco guy eco-friendly uh, greeny watermelon probably uh, from not the area and uh, I don't know how much they did or did not know but none of this is secret information so uh, I think this is a major blow to whatever credibility there may or may not have been for conspiracy theory. You know, is it just so happened they did a story about a place that I'm not as close to intimately familiar with as I could be, and uh, they did an extremely terrible and sloppy job. I like Jesse Ventura. I like his anti governmentness He's not an anarcho-capitalist by a long shot, but he's at the very least willing to entertain the possibility that the government does evil things. And he doesn't even think of it as a possibility. He assumes that they do. That makes him um, basically good as gold in terms of uh, normal political discourse in the United States. There are very few mainstream people. And as a former governor, he is about as mainstream as you can be. Uh, like, I, I can respect that, but I think that this show... Uh, you know, and some of the other ones are just crazy. I'm just watching one right now about the reptilians. So <clears throat> now just to wrap this up with a little bit of political theory, um, the implicit argument being made throughout the entire um, show was that privatizing water is bad. It's theft. That water is a basic need and that it should be owned by the public. And implicit in that argument is that if it was operated as a public utility and not privately then there wouldn't be a problem and that is a hundred percent bullshit because anything that's public is really government which is not the and when government runs something it doesn't mean that the people control it in any meaningful sense it means that whoever it is within government that is operating that part of the bureaucracy if it's the president if it's the head of some agency they have if not complete control they have more control than any aggregate of the population or certainly any particular person and they're incentivized to use that resource for their um, personal gain uh, this kind of reminds me of another documentary I saw the day before this called Gasland which was talking about how well it's the public land and it's, it's my land it's your land it's not your land because Dick Cheney was able to basically sell it to the oil companies and you and I are not able to sell it to the oil companies Dick Cheney was so um, it wasn't public land, it was government land, and Dick Cheney had had the ability to dispose of it as he saw fit, at least within some parameters, more so than you or I. Um, water is, is an important resource, and there are serious questions about water availability in uh, government, and especially in areas where water is scarce, specifically the Southwest, uh, have... Um, just created terrible incentives that are enormously wasteful. They subsidize things like farmers. Uh, they try and make it free for urban dwellers. They do all kinds of stuff. They use the power of um, the political power to basically steal. You know, uh, water is very valuable, so a city like Los Angeles should be willing to pay a high premium for it. Uh, the people who have water up in whatever the aquifers and water uh, headwaters of the rivers in the Sierra Nevadas and other mountain ranges uh, by their private property rights they want the water themselves I'm sure they'd be willing to sell it at the right price and uh, given how much wealth is in LA eventually there would have I mean the demand would have kept increasing and at some point the price would have been enough that the people who own the property around the water 
would be willing to sell it to their betterment they would become wealthy and they would only agree to the exchange once they thought that the remuneration was adequate so there can't be any question that they were ripped off because they didn't agree to sell any until they got what they thought was enough but that was not necessary because of government and government was able to just say well LA has more higher population they have more democratic power and they just took the water uh, and there's a couple really famous examples of that areas that used to be orange orchards and you know uh, agricultural are now completely deserts because the city of LA uh, th via th via the state government of California has basically just stolen that water has taken it um, and that is an example of public control but it's the short-sighted incentives of government and the uh, rational ignorance of democracy uh, combining to squander what is indeed a very precious resource. So uh, the implicit assumption in this in this show was that you know if only the government would have it, but you're going to have a tragedy of the commons every time you have a situation like this. Uh, the water bottling plant here is taking something that is essentially my tap water. Um, and if you ever, uh, I don't know how much they sell in the United States. Um, they say Ice Mountain on the bottles uh, from that bottling plant and it says Stanwood, Michigan. That's basically my tap water. So they're taking my tap water uh, and they're selling it at like a dollar a liter, some you know ridiculous amount, which <laughs> I mean, people are willing to pay for it. That's fine. But at that rate, you know, if they were going to sell the entire Great Lakes at that at that rate, I mean, there hasn't been a wealthier spot in the entire world if that's what they're going to do. Because um, they're selling it more than they sell oil for, for for a given volume. I don't know about mass. Probably not, because uh, water is heavier than oil. But um, yeah, uh, if we have private property in water, then the owners of it will only part with it if they are uh, given what they deem to be sufficient compensation. Which means they won't screw themselves. You know if. If you only have enough water to keep yourself alive, then you won't sell it at any price. If you have just enough to keep yourself alive and a little bit extra, you probably still won't sell that little bit extra, but if you did, it would be at a very high price. And if you have an abundant amount, say you're on top of some aquifer or by a great lake, for instance, um, you'll sell it pretty cheap. But as the supply shrinks, you're very likely to start asking for more and more, which is going to slow the decline and eventually halt it and will even cause you to do things to try and um, maintain its you know, level. Everyone would prefer that their resource last forever. It's not always possible, but uh, if, if, if you can make money by doing it, then you have an incentive to do this. It's very similar to game animals in Africa. If you have a national park, then nobody has a property interest in the animals, and there's a very strong incentive to poach. There isn't much disincentive to stop them. Government agents who protect the animals can't drive a living off of their existence. Um, so they don't do a good job of protecting it. It is possible sometimes with enough money to have enough um, security that you can maybe slow poaching. But in other areas of Africa, specifically South Africa, uh, animals don't belong to the state. They belong to whoever's land they're on. So it's perfectly legal to say shoot elephants on your property and that means that all the elephants are extinct in South Africa, right? No, it means that people in South Africa who have the fortune of having land that might have elephants on it are happy because then they can go to Ted Nugent and say, hey, you can come and shoot one of the elephants on my land. All you have to do is pay me $150,000 or whatever it is they charge. And uh, that's you know, money for them, and then they have an interest in saying, well, we want there to be elephants here, so we can charge all the Ted Nugents of the world to come and shoot them. And I, I say elephants, but I could have in, inserted any other game animal. And that same thing happens right here, too, with deer. On the public land, the deer populations are decimated by, by the tragedy of the commons. Everyone goes out there to hunt. The private land, which are all much smaller plots, and they're all managed by the selfishness of the people who own them, they want to have deer on their land too, for whatever reason. And they um, will propagate them when they want them. They'll cull them when they don't. And uh, 
if you want to hunt deer, basically you have to know someone who has private land, which is not that hard. Everyone has a friend who has private land. I don't even hunt, and I've had people come and say, hey, uh, I don't want the deer on my land. You can kill as many as you want, blah, blah, blah. So uh, water rights, animal rights should not be run by the government. They misallocate resources. All the bad incentives and rational ignorance that happens for every other government decision are going to be applied then, and that's very unfortunate when we're talking about precious things like water. Uh, and uh, also, I guess the message here is that conspiracy theory uh, really has to be taken with more than just a single grain of salt because uh, the the presentation that I saw was, I know, to be shoddy in the extreme. So that's it. Oh, and check out check out Roman Roman's book report. And if Roman sees this, I hope you make many more videos because I've I've been uh, watching your YouTube videos infrequently as they've been made, going all the way back to probably 2009 at least, if not uh, two or three years before that. So right, that's it.